Hello everyone and welcome to the Speculative Wildlife Research Center, where we reimagine creatures and monsters from all realms of fiction through the lens of speculative biology. Today we will be continuing our Godzilla series by taking a look at the original one from the 1954 movie Gojira. In this movie, Godzilla acted as an allegory of the atomic bomb a mere nine years after the bombings of Japan and the tone of the movie very effectively reflects the horror of such events, possibly better than any other Godzilla movie afterwards. As with the last video, I did not want to stray too far from the meaning behind the creature, but this one will have a lot more species-wide speculative biology, as I'll explain later on. In case you haven't watched the Shin Godzilla video, I recommend you do it to better understand why I worked some aspects of this creature the way I did, especially in regards to its size. Also, if you enjoy these videos, please consider supporting the channel on Kofi, link available in the video's description. So, without further ado, let's get started. Today, we will meet another creature that, like countless others, humans or otherwise, suffered from the consequences of humanity's technological progress. The Gojira are close relatives to the creature known as Cetosuchus Gojira, but such phylogenetic closeness is not the reason for their similar names. Not quite reaching the immense sizes of their cousins, the biggest Kojira can reach 25 meters or over 80 feet in length and specialize on hunting small, deep sea fauna rather than acting as filter feeders. The Kojira, while mostly aquatic, will rise onto land in order to lay their eggs. These are kept below ground level, under mounds made of sand by the parents. The eggs will be cared for by both parents which will take turns to swim away and feed in order to keep their strength. As one parent feeds, the other will stay put and patrol the area, driving away any potential danger to their eggs. While the sand protects them from variations in outside conditions, the mound will have to remain at a constant temperature in order for the hatchlings to survive. Furthermore, as with other crocodiles, the temperature of the nest will affect the sex of the hatchlings. If the temperature is too low, all newborn will be female, and if it's too hot, all will be male. In order to regulate the temperature of the nest, the Gojira have developed a special tool. Inside their bodies, special compartments have been formed from the lungs, which can hold large volumes of water. Inside these compartments, rapid muscle movements will heat the water until it has achieved very high temperatures, and the Gojira will shoot the highly pressurized vapor out of its mouth. As hot as the water is, the Gojira's heating chambers, throat and mouth are insulated against the heat, and the water will be shot intermittently in order to avoid heating its body too much. The Gojira will shoot these hot jets of vapor on top of the mound, heating the nest to a desired temperature. While the heat warms the nest, the sand surrounding the eggs will stop the water droplets, preventing them from cooling the nest as they condense. Once the eggs hatch, the young Gojira will stay near their parents until they are a couple of years old. The hatchlings will grow quickly, and by that age will already be half the size of their parents, big enough to hunt and survive on their own. While very useful for hitting their nests, this breath weapon is also very useful for hunting. A single shot from this weapon will almost boil the water in front of the Gojira, instantly killing most wildlife in a small radius which the creature will then devour. While certainly a destructive hunting method, a single meal of merely 10% the creature's mass will sate the Gojira for a couple of weeks. 
These creatures have a dense subdermal layer of fat, similar to that of other marine creatures, such as sea turtles, which helps protect them from the cold water of the ocean. While a valuable asset by itself, this fat also helps them regulate their buoyancy in order to either drive deeper or ascend to the surface. Special deposits of fat situated near the lower back act in a manner similar to the proposed function of sperm whales spermaceti. By warming up the water inside their heating chambers, the fat near this area will become liquid and much less dense, therefore making the animal lighter and more buoyant. Instead, by drinking cold water and storing it inside these deposits, the fat will become solid and denser, making the gojira much heavier and helping it dive more easily. This allows the gojira to go from the ocean surface to the depths in a matter of minutes, even enabling it to walk on the ocean floor with ease. While they are perfectly capable of swimming in order to reach land, it is not rare for them to simply walk the ocean floor, climbing along it until they have reached the surface. Once they are on land, the weight of these fat deposits, as well as the concentrated mass of their tail and hind limbs, helps them maintain a bipedal posture. Their strong heart, adapted to the effort of diving, helps them resist this position, sending adequate amounts of blood to the brain. Given how much the Gojira spend diving and rising to the surface, preferring prey found near the ocean floor, their ears have developed a special muscular covering, evolved from the ear flaps crocodiles use to prevent water from entering their ear canal. This protects the Gojira's ears, preventing them from being damaged by the immense pressure they withstand underwater. While they usually stay far away from human presence, the Gojira too had to suffer the consequences of humanity's thirst for violence. In 1954, as atomic weapons kept being tested away from human civilizations, one particular test ended up destroying the nesting sites of a large population of Gojira. One lone survivor of the colony swam away, scared by the explosion of the bomb, heavily injured and contaminated by radiation. As it desperately searched for food, it strayed too close to fishing areas near Japan, destroying many vessels in the process, either stealing their catch or trying to devour the ships themselves. It eventually made land on Odo Island, where it searched for more survivors of its species. As it did, it caused great damage to the rural populations of the island. The lonely Gojira eventually reached Japan, where it was attacked in order to prevent the kind of damage that nearby Odo Island suffered. While the creature's scale armor protected it from most of the attack, depth charges finally drove it away. Few animals in nature seem to understand the idea of revenge, usually limited to the smartest species such as chimpanzees, elephants and dolphins. What happened next, however, can only be described as that exact thing, revenge. The Gojira seemed to care not for sources of food as it ravaged Tokyo, attacking with the might of an angered animal. Its breath weapon caused many short circuits, soon causing electrical fires. In the end, the beast was finally taken down, but not before the damage had been done. The creature's body had been contaminated by the radiation of the bomb, and the vapor it used as a weapon dispersed across the city, contaminating food and water supplies the effects of which would be much more harmful in the long term than even the creature's rampage. The impact this creature had led to it being given its name, Gojira, from a legendary being from Odo Island folklore, said to come from the ocean and feast on humanity. The destruction brought by this creature was, in the end, nothing but a symptom of a bigger problem. 
As nuclear weapon tests continued, history repeated itself over and over, until it became clear the title could fit more than one creature. And that's it for a speculative biology look into the original 1954 Gojira. It was a fun challenge to give another try to this monster and give it a different biology and personality than that of our last video. While both versions of Godzilla have a lot in common, especially since this specific version of the kaiju was also heavily damaged by radiation, it looks and acts like a much more functional, lifelike creature than Shin Godzilla, and I wanted to reflect that on its design and story. That said, I did want to do some things similar to the other video. For instance, I once again didn't want to make this kaiju too big, as it would make the creature impossible according to both biology and physics something I talked about in more detail in the last video. Also, I didn't want to leave out the nuclear aspect of Godzilla, as it was originally created as an allegory of the atomic bomb, and I feel leaving that out of the equation would be a disservice to what it means. This movie, especially, really takes the time to show the horrors of nuclear weaponry using Godzilla as a metaphor, and is really effective at that. If you haven't seen the movie, I'd recommend giving it a watch if you are in the mood for a serious, tragic monster movie. In the end, I really enjoyed working on this episode, and I hope you guys enjoyed it as well. Thanks to all who asked to see even more Godzillas in the show, and to all who keep giving your suggestions. If there's any type of creature you would like me to give the speculative biology treatment in the show, Please sound off in the comments below. Thank you all for watching and see you next time on the Speculative Wildlife Research Center.